Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the stochastic astronomy podcast, where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the hosts are enthusiastical. Oh. Woo! We are Strange Charm and Top the Astroquarks, also known as Josh Caldwell, Addie Dove, and Jim Cooney, coming to you from the Walkabout Studios at the University of Central Florida. Be sure to stick around at the end of the episode to see us shut off like automata. And I, put, I don't even know how to pronounce that word. I want to say, I think that's correct. is that right? Yeah, automata? Yes. Automata. Automata. The plural of, plural of an automaton. An automaton I'm good with. Automatons. What about an automaton ton? Oh. An, au- an, an automated ton ton. An automata ton ton. Wouldn't keep you very warm if you were caught in a snowstorm. No. Our stumpers are mathematical. They all usually physical. are. <laughs> Uh, so exciting for the <laughs> uh, Jim, yes, D'Alembert's principle or Hamilton's principle? So, uh, <laughs> awkward this pause. Is, yeah, this, is a, this is an awkward one. Yeah, the um, I, I will go with uh, Hamilton's principle. Okay. Uh, what those both are, are uh, different ways of expressing the fundamental laws of mechanics. Yes. Mm. Uh, when you first learn physics, you learn Newton's laws, F equals MA, and, and the other Newton's laws. And that's one way of expressing the fundamental laws of physics. And then when you... And you use, learn them in usually very simplified Yeah, forms. yeah. Um, and then you go on later in the semester and you learn about a different way of expressing the laws of physics, the conservation laws, conservation of momentum and energy. And when you go on and take upper level physics courses, you learn about even different ways of expressing the very same laws of physics. You learn about uh, Lagrangian mechanics and Hamiltonian mechanics, and the Hamiltonian mechanics is the uses the Hamilton uh, principle there, or Hamilton's principle. Um, and I'm not going to try and explain what it is about because it's uh, you know complicated, but it's a beautiful thing, and it, it basically says something like, you know, if you have, you know. Uh, a, a system that's in one state and it goes to a different state. If you want to find out how it goes from one to the other, you look at every possible way it could go from one to the other and then minimize some quantity that's associated with each one of those paths. That sounds like um, Feynman's sum over history that's right. thing. And it is. It essentially is, right? So this is what, what led Feynman to his uh, ideas. I mean, the same ideas work in quantum physics that work in relativity, that work in classical physics. Uh, that's the why those, those these tools. principles are yeah. so beautiful because they're generalizable. Now, the one thing I'll say about the D'Alembert's uh, principle is it's actually even more general than the Hamiltonian one, oh, which yeah. uh, that's which I, I like. Go for it. I, I <laughs> thought about going for it, but the fact is, how often do you actually use that in your life? And I don't oh. know. It depends on who you are. <laughs> it depends on, <laughs> it depends on who you are. Speaking as the strange astrocork. Yeah. At least consciously, not often. <laughs> <laughs> not often. It's um, maybe it's popping up in some stuff that I do somehow, and some it's like some buried assumption somewhere in some programs, but yeah, I don't think it's so. conceivable. Much more often, I think you know, as a working physicist, you use the uh, Hamiltonian stuff, which is uh, what I've used. So you really like it because it's practical. It's practical. Yeah. It's easy. Yeah. You it's like to roll up your shirt sleeves, get out your Hamiltonian. There you go. That's right. right. Okay. Solves the problems. All right, Addie. Yes. Integral or derivative? Um, I was trying to come up with some sort of punny answer to that just now. And I decided failed. not to. <laughs> <laughs> it would be too derivative if I did. Oh, there, there you go. Yeah. Um, um, I think derivatives. I always thought derivatives were easier than integrals. Yeah. Well. Somehow I, going forward always seemed easier than going backwards. Yeah, I think that's true. I don't know, we certainly learn derivatives first, right? In right. calculus, you learn yeah. derivatives, then you yeah. learn integrals. Integrals are cool because, you know, we use them to understand areas and, you know. Yeah, I think um, in integration, when we were learning it, you learn all these tricks and tools. If it's this kind of function, you do this yeah. sort of approach. And if it's that kind of function, you do this substitution, and then that turns into this other thing. And then you look it up in a book. There are fun tables of integrals. Table of integrals and true. Does like anybody that. use those anymore? It's like Probably. Or do you just well, use Wolfram Alpha? The internet is now. You just use Wolfram Alpha. Yeah, you use these powerful programs. But somebody, yeah. has to, somebody has to code those things up. 
Right. Or you just, I mean, if, if it depends on whether you're doing a definite integral or not, but if you're doing a definite integral, you, you just have the actual it. computer brute force, yeah. which is super inelegant. Yeah. Because an integral is adding up the area under some wavy line or surface or So you can count the triangles thing. underneath your curve. And the computer can actually just go ahead and do that. Yeah. It can make little tiny slivers and add it all up. Yeah. Anyway, well, today we'll take a look back at some of the highlights from the first annual year of the Astro. <laughs> also known as 2019. Perfect. Will we get super lucky and see Beetlejuice? Sure. Sure. Go Beetle supernova. You be guys careful were, how many times we being, say it during this. You were being super fancy with your pronunciation later. We'll get to that. Uh, probably not. It's doing something interesting anyhow in the meantime. Uh, and how does the universe age? We'll talk Gracefully. About, that's probably true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, after its initial... Initial. Business. I mean, everybody has a little bit of an issue. Everybody outbursts, has some problems some with starting pains. off. Yeah. Um, and so, and sort of where are we in that whole aging process with galaxies and star formation? Um, and uh, one of my favorite topics, Cassini. What? what? Which is gone, but there's Thank a new you. paper out uh, from my colleague Dick French and colleagues talking about uh, one armed spiral waves in uh, Saturn's ring, so we'll talk about that. But first, this episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by the Lagrangian. <laughs> oh. If you need to track down some scum or villains, or if you're engaged in some scum and villainy yourself, then find yourself a Mandalorian. For everything else, there's the Lagrangian. This generalized function can be tuned to meet your specific needs, whether they are finding the orbit of a planet or a child on a swing. The Lagrangian will adapt to meet your dynamics needs. Try out our Lagrangian multipliers for extra benefit, and let us do some virtual work with D'Alembert's principle at no extra charge. With relativistic versions as well as classical, the Lagrangian is guaranteed to adapt to your needs. There are some things physics can't solve. For everything else, there's the Lagrangian. Very nice. nice. Thank you, Lagrangian. The, I'm happy uh, to have them the, on board. There are, there are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's... Oh. Uh... MasterCard. That's right. Nice. Okay. <laughs> that was a close one. I know. We would have been in serious trouble. I know. So yeah. I definitely got that. Actually, the Lagrangian, not MasterCard, is sponsoring this episode, though. Correct, yes. Yes. Uh, speaking of The Mandalorian, however, its first season, season eight episode season finished. It's so short. It was That's short. It was nice, though. And my wife wasn't really interested in it, but I, summer, I was trying to talk her into watching the last episode with me, and she okay. hadn't watched any episodes. Okay. And so I said, well, let me summarize the first seven episodes for you. And it went something like this. <laughs> there's Spoiler this, alerts. There's oh, my gosh. I haven't there, seen any. Go ahead. I, think, I don't think this is really a spoiler alert. Fair enough. There's a bounty hunter who always wears a full armor thing, and you never see his face, called a Mandalorian. And he gets a bounty to go get something, and when he gets it, it turns out it's a baby Yoda. And since he was an orphan, and the baby Yoda's an orphan, he decides to protect it. Okay. And he gets chased around. He gets, yeah. He gets chased around by Hygiene. people who want the baby Yoda. And some other side quest type things, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> mostly random other things. Yes. So it was. It was. It was readily summarized. Did she watch that episode? She did not. No. She declined the <laughs> it did not work. <laughs> and then I gave her an even more succinct summary of the eighth episode, which I will not summarize here because it is spoilers. Yeah. I did so that. a lot of, I've seen a lot of I mean people really like it for the most part, but there's been a lot of some criticism I've seen that's like nothing's happened. The episode right. blah blah blah. <laughs> and I'm like, I kinda like a, a show that's just like a story where yeah. in an episode something happens and it does a little bit of character development yeah. and you learn more about the world and the civilization, and it's going to build from there. Right. Like, I yeah. kind of like a simple story. It doesn't have to be this. I mean, it's in the Star it's Wars universe, so epic. everybody expects it to be. Right. Yeah, this giant epic thing <laughs> with ten different plot points throughout the episode. Right. <laughs> Star Wars. Oh, is that a reference to Star Wars Episode Nine? It is. Yeah. Uh, Except there was like a hundred different plot points. Okay, so that was the, our other in our other nerd news because space news was sort of quiet. Yeah, this quiet. is. I did see that. So we're recording on December thirtieth. And I did see that t it's the, um, um, and on December 30th, 1930, was when the first ever photo of the Earth's, cur Earth's curvature was taken, proving that the Earth is round. False. <laughs> and that was taken <laughs> how? Um, in a, in a record-breaking balloon flight by an Air Force 
uh, or an Army Air Corps lieutenant colonel. Was there a person in it? Or yeah. Was it? Okay. He um, took a flight, and he had this like some new developed film technology at the time, so like was taking an image of how the mountain range. Get? Um, I couldn't actually see how high the flight. I didn't actually do that much detail. So how high do you generally have to be to see the curvature of the Earth? Uh, Five depends feet. Depends on how good your vision is. Right. Yeah. Right. But. So they were able, he was able to see uh, mountains 300 miles away with this that he couldn't see with his eyes, but the photograph was able to see. So that was why he was able to do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How I mean, high was it? I don't know. Right. Anyhow, I don't. We, we don't do want to go math. down. The, we, we don't want to go down. We can point to some YouTube videos that tell you all of these things. The the whole flat Earth uh, tunnel today. <laughs> we'll save that yeah. for another time. Um, but Star Wars Nine is out. You two have seen it. I have. I am embarrassed somewhat chagrined to say I've not yet seen it but opinion seems to be somewhat split if you liked surprising. 8 uh -huh. you hated 9 and okay. vice versa uh, I can see that which makes me optimistic for 9 because you hated 8 Yes. Yeah. but apparently like I did watch the honest trailer for 8 uh -huh. and the two things that I really hated about it were included in that honest trailer as bad you know, on the critical side. Uh -huh. It's a hilarious, honest trailer because it's yeah, got really the good, good side. And, the, and it's like there were some good things in it. Like, I did like the, some of the good things. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were things about Episode Eight that I liked. And then there were things about it that ruined it for me. Yeah. But anyway. It was mostly a waste of time. Episode Eight. And it turns out when you see the new one, like... It was a total waste of time. because entirely <laughs> a waste of time. Because in Episode Nine, they just decided, let's pretend Eight never happened. Well, because Eight was this weird thing where they pretended like the previous episode didn't, happen. didn't really happen or they weren't going to go off of it. And Yeah. 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 I think, yeah. The, so there's there are a few really good things that I liked in Nine. Um, but there's also like a hundred different things that happen because they're much. trying to tie in all these plot points that they wanted and the fans wanted and all these different things. And it's like, just, 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 just take just, most of that things out and just finish telling the story right. and make it this nice, simple thing. And it would have been right. fine. There was, uh, been on, a, on a sort of much less nerdy note, um, the HBO series Deadwood. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Why is that less nerdy? Um, <laughs> I think most people would say it's less nerdy. It's just nerdy in a different way. It's a uh, fair point. Fair <laughs> point. It's cowboy nerds or yeah, something like exactly. that. Old, no. old, old, Except old cowboy West. nerds aren't called nerds, right? They're old, just called... They're, just, they're cool people. Oh, right. There you go. <laughs> cowboys. So, Old West nerdiness versus uh, science fiction nerdiness. Mm -hmm. um, I, that when they made that show, it ran for three seasons, and I think the people, the creative people behind the show, David Milch and others, were expecting to do an, a, at least one more season. So it sort of just ended you know, if, without any sort of wrap up of many storylines that were going along. Many years later now, 10 years later, something like that, they've come back and they made a movie. Oh, and I felt yeah. the same oh, way nice. about that Deadwood movie they is that they felt, oh my gosh, in two hours, we have to resolve all of the things that were left dangling at the end of a three season run of a TV show. And it was like, I, I just it was. Too much. Yeah. It yeah. was just whiplash back and forth. Oh, this thing wrapped up with Nepo, put that one aside, now go do this one. Anyway, this is an astronomy podcast though, right? Yes. Okay, cool. I believe so. Right. Fun up astronomy podcast. Yay. Oh, it's a what? Fun. It's the fun up astronomy It's the fun podcast. astronomy podcast. It's the t stochastic astronomy podcast. It is oh, stochastic. Yeah. stochastic. Yes, yes, always. Okay. Yes. Um, what does stochastic mean? Random. Yeah. Jumping Generally. around. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about our highlights from the first First annual year, of the, year of the Astro Corps. Corps. The first annual year of the Astro I Corps. actually, one, I was just thinking, well, a fun thing to do, because I always have trouble remembering what year things happened in, so I had sure. to be like, go back, and, <laughs> would be to do a like, did this happen this year or in previous years? Because right. there was one time I said something about Rosetta being like last year, and it was in 2014 it was, or yeah, something. Right. So, <laughs> Many years ago. Right? I don't know. I did the same thing. I was like, oh, this was cool. And I was like, wait, was that 2019 this year? or 2018? And there was a lot this year, right? It started off with a bang with um, the... New Horizons flyby of Ultima Thule. Was that this year? It was. <laughs> At the very beginning of the year, yeah? Okay. January 1st Yeah, or something, like January yeah. 1st. January 1st this year. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, was that your favorite thing of the year? No. That was a good thing. It was thing. just, it started off with a bang. Okay. It was exciting. It was do you have a favorite thing for the year? Um, I don't know if I can do, like, one favorite. I have a few favorite things, I think. To uh, paraphrase, to be really stochastic now. Yeah. To uh, quote Ian Anderson frontman of classic rock band Jethro Tull. Yes. It's like asking somebody 
which is your favorite finger? Right. Yeah. You like all of them. I, I, right? Well, I could probably true, a, but a more favorite finger. You would have to others. choose. Like, you might, you uh, if, somebody, choose. if somebody said, I'm going to chop off nine of your fingers, <laughs> you had to choose one. Oh, <laughs> uh, then it's just pointless. Maybe if they were going to do that, though, I'd want to keep my middle finger. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> then you just want to be <laughs> completely silent. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, what are some of your favorite things? We could um, sing it. We could, a few of our favorite things. Oh, yes. we could have made a song for it. Um, let's see. So we'll totally do that and put it on. There YouTube. was a bunch of Osiris Rex and Bennu stuff. Right. So or asteroid stuff. So I'll lump O Rex and Hayabusa two together, maybe. Right. So. Uh, Osiris Rex is around the asteroid Bennu, which was found to be spitting out particles. That was one of my Unexplained. Yeah. Still don't really know why. Um, and then all the stuff with um, Hayabusa 2 at Ryugu has been super amazing. It touching down on the surface and it's coming, it's on its way back now. Um, and then with samples. With samples, yeah. So lots of cool, and like just imaging them and closer up imaging of them and all of the dynamics and everything has right. been super exciting. Yeah, pretty all cool. Year. I had the pebbles Spitting Pebbles. off of of, Ryu, of Bennu is uh, one of my one of my tops for they sure. Should name things after Flintstones characters. Pebbles. Um, Voyager two left the solar system. We talked about recently. Again. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, there were the Starliner and Crew Dragon tests with varying degrees of success, but progress was made. Yeah, there's there. been some cool space flight stuff. Yeah. There was the two woman spacewalk, first time ever. Two the, women, all women spacewalk. The somewhat controversial deployment of the first batch of communication satellites from mm -hmm. SpaceX. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, and what? second batch. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> to me, there was a clear coolest thing. We were thing. saving it we're for you. Right. Which was, of course, uh, I'm sure it was most popular. It's going to be something well. about Cassini, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, of course, was the uh, first image of a black hole. Yes. Very fun. Um, with so the Event Horizon Telescope. With the Event Horizon. Of course, that data was taken over the course of, you know, before 2019, but right. they, it was uh, finally analyzed in the first uh, picture released in 2019. So Some crazy processing is required to, yes. put that, some, some to make that image. A and lot that, of work that, by a lot of folks. That's the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy M87, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, some tens of millions of light years away. And the other one that they believe they can image is our own, very own, Sagittarius A star. Sagittarius A star. So I would watch out for 2020. I bet that's yeah, going to be a reasonably exciting thing in 2020. I bet that image comes out. They have collected the data for that? Yeah, the data is collected. It's just, it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge, and more challenging, even though it's closer, it's more challenging for a number of reasons, one of which it changes over very short time scales, which means that if all of your data isn't taken at the same time, it becomes very difficult to come up with a single image of it. But anyway, they, they'll come up with something in 2020. I right. bet. Okay, that's your first prediction for 2020? Ast yeah. Astro prediction? Ooh. Um, yeah. So uh, in our actual uh, science topic-y news, um, I'll mention the Cassini one as uh, just to kick us off, and then we'll Great. do our trivia. Um, the uh, Saturn's rings, one of, one of my favorite things. You may have uh, heard of them before. Yeah. Has all these waves in it that mm -hmm. are produced by uh, gravitational perturbations from the many moons around Saturn. And the number of moons around Saturn, was it Saturn or Jupiter that got Saturn. 20 new moons? Yeah, Saturn. It's so Saturn's up to like 82 moons, of the moons or something. Right. So some of those moons close to the rings uh, give these periodic gravitational shoves to the ring particles in a sort of concerted way that causes the ring particles to move in an organized way and it has these ring uh, waves uh, propagate across the ring super slowly. And most of the waves are like um, slinky waves, compressional waves like sound waves mm -hmm. where, th so they're called density slinky waves. Slinky waves are not the technical term. They're <laughs> not, but, but I like to call them We commonly that. use that, yeah. They're, they're called density waves, spiral density waves because they, uh, ring particles are, get compressed closer together and then further apart and closer together and further apart as the wave propagates. And it's the same kind of wave that gives the Milky Way galaxy its spiral pattern. Mm -hmm. right? And the Milky Way, how many spiral arms does the Milky Way have, Jim? Just a handful. I don't know the number. It's a few. It's like, it's yeah. A, it's a few. Just and a few. typical spiral galaxies, it's a few. Well, the, the new uh, paper uh, 
they have identified several waves in Saturn's rings mm -hmm. that have just one arm, one ah. single spiral arm, mm. uh, which involves a very particular sort of perturbation that's caused it. It's not coming from the moons, but it's coming probably from rings within the rings causing, within the rings that oh. are perturbing nearby rings. Some, and my my favorite one is that there's like a ringlet in the rings, mm -hmm. and it's got one of these one arm spirals moving across it and that wave reflects uh, off the outer edge of the ringlet mm -hmm. and comes back as a negative version of itself and those two waves then add on top of each other and they make this, they make this uh, sort of pulsating circular breathy thing that doesn't cool. look like spiral wave at all so that's cool we'll post some pictures about it because it's so a, cool a one-armed it's like spiral a one-armed wave. Bandit. Is it really like, I guess, is it like really like a spiral arm? Would you? It is. It wraps around multiple times. Oh, okay. So it wraps around, but there's just one of them. So it's like how I, how people usually draw spirals. That's right. If you just drew a single spiral, yeah. it'd be that. And that's mm -hmm. not what the particles are doing, but it's what the pattern of the particles mm. is doing. So there's this disturbance. There is a disturbance in Saturn's rings. So there are, if I'm not mistaken, there are lots and lots of structures in Saturn's rings that we do not understand. So there are some that are... <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't mention that, Jim. Right, right. No, but my question is, what is your prediction? So uh, a lot of the big scale structures we do understand. They're, they're the things, like you said, they're, they're density waves created by moons, and we understand why they're there and what they, why they look the way they do. But then there are lots of other structures that we don't understand. Will there come a time when we understand all of the large-scale structure of Saturn's rings? Or is it too complicated? And it uh, galaxy far, far away. You know, that's, that's a valid and interesting and disturbing question. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the waves are one class of feature, as you said, that we understand pretty well. And there are a couple other things that we understand fairly well on smaller-scale stuff. There's a couple of big scale things that we understand pretty well, like the shape of the inner edge of the two main rings. Right. We have a we have some sort of explanation for why they look that way. But then there's all all sorts of other stuff. Like if you look at the rings they're all very super stripey. And most of those stripes we don't know why they're there. Right. And you're asking me if we'll ever really know why they're there. Yeah. I hope so. But we haven't I would say I don't really feel like we're particularly closer to knowing why they're there 20 years or 30 years after I started looking at rings. So I haven't, I've helped, I've made no contributions. <laughs> I would not say that. I would not say that. Good fact, I've well. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me, let me lay some trivia on you. Oh, and then we'll, all move right. out, all right. we'll move out into the stellar and the Ready. astrophysical. Patty and I are ready to dominate. That's okay. right. The trivia in keeping with the sponsor is somewhat mathematical. It would be trivial to us. It may be. It may well be trivial to you. The question is, which of the following is not a real mathematical term? I thought you were going to say a real number. I was like, I got this. Oh. <laughs> uh, a, vinculum. Okay. B, googleplex. Okay. C, anthema. D, camembert. <laughs> E, apothem. Oh, man. <laughs> huh. Is that yeah. one a trick? <laughs> I will come back to those. Oh, oh man. I will reread those. This is more those. about the psychology of Josh. Than <laughs> right. mm -hmm. I'll reread those choices to you. So uh, we started off with Lagrangians and D'Alembert's mm -hmm. and Hamilton's and integrals and derivatives. Uh, so some more, much more, <laughs> at least to us, since we're not really mathematicians. No. I don't even need the... You don't they even need to say really. really. Yeah, we're, we're just, just not, not mathematicians. We're not mathematicians. Uh, so we which, don't play them on TV. No. <laughs> not even on our podcast. Not even. <laughs> <laughs> so which of those is not a real mathematical term? We'll come back to that and we'll tell you. They all four of them are. Yeah. One of them is not. Kay. Okay. Let's talk about Beetlejuice. 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 Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> Too late. No. That'd be fun. Okay. My brother was the second AD on that movie. Oh, that's and pretty awesome. Such a good movie. It's it is. Movie. And when Michael Keaton first appears, like uh -huh. in the, is it in a model railroad or something? Or is it so. some sort of like diorama as a little tiny little person? House, their little town thing, yeah. And so and that that's the first time he appears in the movie. Mm -hmm. And he does this long, hilarious thing, mm -hmm. uh, monologue. That was entirely improvised. Oh, man. 
Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Gacy was said the crew was just, you know, stifling <laughs> laughter uh, as he was doing that. Yeah. That's so pretty it, awesome. Yeah. He's, he made that movie. I mean, that was, it was uh, great. such a great job. Well, they were technically I mean, it was a great movie. movie. In, yeah. I mean, in many respects. But yeah. He was I mean, so Winona Ryder and really yeah, yeah, um, Jeffrey Jones and... I'm so mad at myself for forgetting the name of the actress who played Gina her Davis. mom. No. Oh, the the um, mom of yeah. Winona Ryder's character. She's okay. great. We've seen her in a lot of things. Anyhow, they were great. Anyway, um, it's a stochastic podcast. Let's talk about the star Beetlejuice. Oh, that's what this is about. Yeah, this has yeah. been getting a lot of press recently. It has. There's a lot of people. A lot of astronomy Twitter people are like, I went out and looked. Astro twits. Astro tweeps. I think okay. people kind of call themselves tweeps, not twits. Oh, much. cool. Sorry. Because so, to be a twit <laughs> is a little bit different. So the background <laughs> for this is that Betelgeuse um, is a very bright star. It is mm-hmm. a supermassive star, typically one of the top ten brightest stars in our night sky, about number six. Makes all the top ten lists. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's And and one Oops. of the reasons we're so very excited about it is because everybody has always been telling us it is a... S- supermassive star that is very near going supernova. Right? We've been we've we've mentioned on I think the last podcast how unlucky we've been, and many podcasts how unlucky we've been that no supernovas have gone off in our neighborhood in a very very long time. This is a star that is on the verge of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and by on the verge, we mean some recent predictions have said something in the next hundred thousand years. Right. So on the verge is astronomically on the verge. Maybe a few hundred thousand years. So you know, this is a, this is a star that was is predicted based on its mass. Its mass is about twenty times the mass of the sun mm-hmm. to have a lifespan of about nine million years or so, which is tiny, of course, compared to the life scale of, uh, or lifespan of our sun, mm-hmm. which is like ten billion years. Yeah. Right. Uh, because big stars burn through their fuel much faster than than small stars. So a thousand times shorter than the age of our right. sun. Right. Very very short lifespan, and we look at it and it appears to be about nine million years old which means that it's yeah. close. on the hairy edge of going berserk uh, and when these things die when a star of 20 solar masses dies it does so in a very violent fashion and goes supernova and Yay. so we're waiting for it but with so, so it's going to happen yes. any day now but any day now on astronomical time scales means sometime in the next few hundred thousand years probably mm. which day, could mean tomorrow any day now with an asterisk <laughs> right it, it could plus be, or minus you could go out tonight and see that bad boy go off uh, but <sighs> it's unlikely but there has been some news recently of course yeah. and that news has been that it's dim that it's getting it, dimmer. It's, it's, it's dimmer. changing. Yeah. It's changing. So it's the dimmest it's been in observations in like since recorded recorded observation times. Right. So Betelgeuse so. generally is a variable star, right? Unlike yeah. our sun, our sun burns at a really constant rate, uh, and only dims or brightens over very long periods of time, billions of years. This uh, Betelgeuse is a variable star, which means it does get brighter and dimmer irregularly on shortish time scales and uh, there have been teams that have been watching this for decades and decades get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer and it used to be people just observe it with the naked eye and you would say you could right. compare them right. and say it's brighter than this right. one it was yeah it's, it, it's, it's 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 obvious enough that yeah with even with the, with the naked eye you know before 100 years ago people could tell it was getting brighter and dimmer uh, but these guys have been carefully watching it over the last few decades mm-hmm. and uh, in the last few months it's been getting notably dimmer very very quickly so the rate at which it's getting dimmer is extreme and then now it has reached a dimness that is it's dimmer than it has been since we've been recording it with instruments yes right yeah and so if i mean i i know it's unlikely we're seeing it about to go supernova Mm -hmm. uh which Mm -hmm. as you said would be awesome it would be half as bright as a full moon and we'd be able to see in the daytime sky for probably weeks or months if it did yeah uh, so cool. It's about 640 light years away, so it's a you know a fairly nearby star. Uh, I like how most articles you read about this are like, don't worry, if it goes not, supernova, it won't affect fine. us. That's right. Yeah, we're totally <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, it's uh, I don't know if you mentioned it's the, one of the shoulder stars in Orion, the constellation Orion. Right. So it's, it's very easily right. I mean, it's a very good, yeah. I mean, the it's Orion has two. Orion. It's the first. It's, star yeah, it's two really bright main. stars, right? Uh, Betelgeuse and and right. Rigel. Rigel. Uh, one at the kind of foot and one at the shoulder, and this is the shoulder one. And they're, it's cool because they're notably different colors, right? Mm-hmm. Beetlejuice is, is very, very red. red. It's a red supergiant. Rigel's also a supergiant, but it's blue. Which is confusing. It is confusing. Rigel starts with an R, and Beetlejuice starts with a <laughs> B. True. Oh, you can't remember it. Yeah. Uh, uh, but so it so has, you can go and we'll so take a look at it. You can, and you should be able to see that it's dimmer than it usually is. So it's right. it's something like the, tw- it's still going to be bright, so you're still going to be able right. to see it. It's like the um, 21st brightest star in the sky right now, as opposed to the 6th, like 
it normally is. So still bright, but but it's dimmer than Rigel than now. Right. So it's oh, dimmer than a companion star that it used and, to be brighter than. And so. if it if it goes supernova, of course, but. that'll be super exciting. We uh. will probably talk about it on a future episode. <laughs> if you it can. doesn't go supernova, it'll probably rebrighten. Yeah. So in it, a time scale of like weeks or months. months. Yeah. Yeah. So that it's, it also tends to have. So apparently, Betelgeuse we talked about being variable. It has a f- like about a six year light cycle and a longer for or a shorter four hundred twenty five day period and they seem to be both overlapping right now okay so it's like when your two periods overlap right, right. then you have an extra it's extra dim but it's still even dimmer than it should be right. for that right okay. but it should come out of that right there's some periodicity to that but there's also a significant irregularity like some that stochastic some nature stoch- to some it exactly stochastic na- right exactly and why you know so why would why is dimmer meaning it's going to explode well you know we expect when it's about to go that it's it's its brightness is going to change rather rapidly and right. mm-hmm. maybe get really bright, maybe get really dim. I mean, it's, it's hard to say. We, yeah, so our we models of, of how this works are not great. Right? Because there's not a lot of data. There's not a lot of data. Because we know when things go supernova after they do, and so right. you can observe it for long times afterwards. Right. There's not a lot of data. And, and it's just complicated, theoretically right. complicated. I mean, the, this, I mean it, the, the, the yeah, Astro actually, 101 version of what's going on inside the star is it runs out of fuel. Right. And the fuel is what's holding up its immense weight. Right. And when it stops burning that fuel, the immense weight collapses down. But there's that's the that's the the simplest possible version of it. Right. And the reality is that there's lots of different kinds of ways there's it can burn of, that's right. and keep itself up so it can pulsate and do all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah, and stuff. It's, it's troublesome because the what's happening in the inside is what determines when it goes supernova. So, you know, when it runs out of when it burns through all of its hydrogen, it starts to burn helium. When it start, burns through all its helium, it starts to burn uh, helium into carbon, and then carbon into oxygen, oxygen. And, and so forth. And then it goes through this chain until it gets to iron. Basically, once it gets through the carbon, it goes through that chain very, very, very quickly. Once it hits uh, iron, then it just goes berserk and the whole thing explodes. But what's happening in the core, that's all happening in the core, and what's happening in the outer layers are not all that connected. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the outer layers of this thing, and this is an enormous star. It's something like, what, seven or eight hundred, nine hundred times the diameter of the sun. This star would uh, reach beyond the orbit of Mars, if it were the star, if it were in the place of our sun, right. possibly out to Jupiter. It's enormous. And it's got all kinds of weird things happening in its outer layers. There's all this convection and so forth. And that's the thing that's primarily fueling this dimming and brightening and dimming yeah. is these convection cells roiling and stuff in the in the star. Um, and what's happening out there is not necessarily intimately connected to what's happening on the inside. But to understand how they are connected and understand how that works, we have to we have to understand the the physics of what's happening inside of these stars, and it's really complicated. It's complicated. It turns out. It turns out. Um, Modeling the and so, is so very yeah, very interesting to observe this, and it's um, yeah. So it's conceivable. Keep keep your eyes out. So how it's far away is it? Six hundred forty light. Six hundred forty light years. Six light years yeah. Ish. So, By the way, that's not as well known as we like to spout off. Oh. It could be plus or minus a hundred light years or something. I mean, it's like. So it's, does that mean it's, it's possible? It's, it's already on supernova. I'm a little bit surprised that for a star that close that yeah. we don't have a more I, precise I am distance. I'm also surprised. This yeah. was. Yeah, why don't we? Uh, so I, 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 I was surprised at this as well. In fact, I was. When is I was, it because the size of the star is so poorly determined? Because it's a big, puffy, pulsating star. It's got stuff around it. Right. And the way for a nearby star like this, I assume we can get a distance from parallax. From parallax, mm-hmm. right. And, but to do that, you have to like be able to see precisely where is the star now and right. precisely where is the star six months later when right. Earth is on the other right. side. And if the star is a big, pulsating, blobby jellyfish of a star, then <laughs> it's hard to actually say where's the center of it, right. maybe. And I'm that's, speculating no, that, And that's, that's partially true. I, I was surprised at that as well. I thought that we had known the distances these nearby stars really, yeah. really well because of parallax. It turns out that there's there's more... Some maybe you know, like the, like the Gaia satellite, which is now doing these parallax measurements, is coming up with somewhat different numbers than Ooh. a lot of our previous parallax measurements, which is frustrating. But in any mm. event, mm. Um, mm. it's 600-ish light years away, mm. which means that it might have gone supernova 500 years ago, and we're about to find That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, our listeners don't need to worry about missing it, no. because it's not like, oh, it's not like a shooting star. Yeah. No, no. Well, if, it, if it does go supernova, and you'll it know. didn't look last night, you'll be able to see it the <laughs> tomorrow. Next night. Or yes. Yeah. You'll know. Yeah. One of yeah. the things I liked about this, too, is that I found out about apparently 
astronomers post um, observations all the time in this thing called the Astronomer's Telegram, which is a website where astronomers do posts and updates about like things to observe and other types of observations to like tell other people to observe also. Um, and this one was called The Fainting of a nearby of the Nearby Red Supergiant Beetlejuice. The Fainting, the fainting, fainting. of. <laughs> and then there was like an update to that. But it's super now cool. I've heard fainting used, used in that way. way. I know. It was great. But That's there's great. also, but yeah, so then like I started looking around. Like well, we do say brightening. Yeah, I would yeah. have said fainting. Fainting. Fainting, fainting. fainting, maybe. But no, they call it fainting. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's things like there was another FRB found. Um, but there's all these posts. It's pretty cool. You can see, like, what and people have observed. And, yeah. yeah. I assume that came from there actually used to be telegrams that were sent. Yeah. And now it's a website, but so, it's pretty cool. So uh, Beetlejuice... Uh, which is Arabic for the armpit of Orion, <laughs> apparently, or huh. the hand of Orion. Uh, four different pronunciations. What's your favorite? Oh, yeah. There's Beetlejuice, Betelgeis. Right. Just <laughs> saying a couple of them. Yeah, I know. Um, I forget some of the, I forget what the other ones yeah. are. Yeah. I've always just pronounced it Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. So knowing that that was like the most American. Americanized or something. Yeah. But I yeah. just what what is the what is the most correct? Is there a is there a most correct? I don't know if there's a most correct. Uh, there's some thing about whether or not you say it is it beetle, beetle, yeah. beetle or beetle, beetle juice. juice or juice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sounds at the end. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. complicated. Beetlejuice works. Just have to specify you're talking about the star and not the movie. The movie. Yes. Um, so we have, uh, do you want to do your trivia guesses before we talk about the, the, the evolution of stars and galaxies? You can take the Beetlejuice and put it into the big picture of <laughs> sure. stellar formation sure. evolution. Sure. Okay. So uh, which of the following is not a real mathematical term? Uh-huh. Okay. Vinculum, Googleplex, Anthema, Camembert, Apothem. I'd be happy to spell any of them if you like. <laughs> Can you use those in a sentence? <laughs> Vinculum may or may not be a real mathematical term. <sighs> All right. Well, uh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, you go first. <laughs> so I feel like I feel like we're being tricked we're because being I, I think Camembert is like a cheese. It's, it's hundred percent a cheese, but it's also like a region in France. So. It could be that... It could also be a mathematical term. It could also be... And I feel like he, he knows that we know it's a cheese, yeah. and so he threw that in there because it's really also mathematical. So I'm going to go with vinculum. Vinculum. Okay. Jim goes with vinculum. I'm going to take the bait and go with camembert. Okay. Because I love cheese, by the way. <laughs> I got you both. Yes. Oh. Although camembert is a little bit of it. Camembert is a sort of French slang term for pie chart. Oh... I don't mm. think that counts. Then French slang term. Mm. Well, it's it is it is it is used to describe pie charts. So, so it is related to the cheese then, because it's like a wheel of camembert. Yeah. That's right. I mean, okay. pie yeah. chart. If I if, if, if I had pie. if I had if I had said pie chart. Is there a mathematical name for a different mathematical name for pie chart? Graphique circulaire. <laughs> Circular graph. Great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, um, <laughs> vinculum. It's super boring. That's it's a the, real thing. It's the horizontal line in a fraction or over a repeating. It's any oh. horizontal line in a mathematical oh. number oh. Did not know that, that, like, binds things together. Hmm. The so vinculum like, comes between the numerator and the denominator. There you go. There you go. You <laughs> uh, Googleplex, you both neither guessed because I'm, that's the that's only it. one of these that I was previously familiar with. Yeah. Right. So Which is... A uh, Google to the Google power? It's 10 to the Google power. 10 to the Google, 10 to the Google power? power. Oh. It's 10 to the power of Google. And Google, not spelled like the search term. No. But no apparently was the inspiration for the search term. I think so, term. yeah. Um, it's G-O-O-G-O-L. Oh, that's right. Google uh, is 10 to the hundredth, and a Googleplex is 10 to the Google. Um, an apothem is the line from the center of a polygon to the midpoint of a side. Okay. And an anthema is something I made up. It's a, so I thought you were just pronouncing it wrong. That's why I didn't guess it because there's a there's a, there's a term the shape that the the sun makes if you track oh, it over the course an of the year. It's an analemma, but there's also which I also say wrong. But then there's something else that's like an, an 
Uh, I just thought you were. There are other it terms wrong. that are similar to yeah. that, which, yeah. which means that it was very. That was, was also a well, well crafted term. Word, I Microsoft almost. Word, also uh-huh. correctly identified that as the one that isn't because it's the only one <laughs> that spell check under it that has red squiggles <laughs> under it. Right. So it did know the other four, but not that one. Um, the last little item is uh, just sort of inspired by this paper that talks about a distant galaxy that seems not seems to be done making stars, which is Why not surprising. Isn't? that it's done making stars. Galaxies tend to stop it, at some point. But the surprising thing about this one is... It stopped a long time ago. When in a galaxy young, far, When far it was away. younger than... Right. Yes. Yeah. Since it's... Yeah, right. Since it's far away, it it's, also means that it was younger when it, it stopped yeah, making. It's at, it's at a redshift of four. Whoa! Right? That's a very, very big redshift. Uh, it's a very, very distant galaxy, which means very young galaxy. Like a billion years old or so right. ballpark. Right, right. Uh, so when galaxies are first born, they're furiously making stars because they're made of big, huge piles of hydrogen, helium, gas to begin with. It's your first born galaxy, after all. <laughs> uh, and and so galaxies, when they're first, when they're young, are are, are furiously <laughs> producing these stars. But at some point, they're going to kind of run out of gas to make stars. It happens to all of us. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I haven't run out yet. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but it's at a slower pace than I don't know, it used to be. I'm just sort of be. thinking about you know relationships, and there's the <laughs> early days, very exciting, <laughs> romantic, and oh, then no, you sort of settle a, into like babies, a more sedate. But this is babies also too. Okay, Make just go stars. ahead, Jim. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> Different analogies. So, um, so one question is, when do they kind of how, how long does it take for these galaxies to stop producing? Uh, lots and lots of new stars because there's a second kind of phase of star formation that is galaxies tend to group together into clusters of galaxies and when individual galaxies collide with other galaxies that brings on new eras of star formation as clouds of gas and dust collide into other clouds of gas and dust which creates so so, so, so we have kind of eras of things happening in the universe and this most recent discovery of this quiescent galaxy at z equals four which is very distant very young Quiescent galaxy is this the youngest one we've seen, which indicates that that might be around the age in general, which galaxies, galaxies start to calm down and, and stop the star formation for the first time before this next generation of star formation so happens. So where's the Milky Way? Is the Milky Way in a quiescent phase? Yeah, the Milky Way is fairly quiescent, right? It's not an active galaxy. I mean, it's producing stars, but at a fairly modest rate. Um, and most of the stars that it's producing are largely probably because of its interactions with nearby galaxies like the Magellanic Clouds and Andromeda and so forth. Okay. I like I that th- this galaxy in this paper is called a massive quenching galaxy. <laughs> quenching. Yes. Quenching, because <laughs> yeah. it's quenching the light because there's not as much uh, star formation, so there's the, it's suppressed, it's right. quenched. Yeah. Right, yeah, I mean, when you don't have active... I mean, a lot of the light from a galaxy is from the very bright stars, right? The things like Betelgeuse and right. Rigel, where... Uh, there are very bright, large stars that die young. And so once they die, they're not producing light. And what you're left with is all of the older stars, like our sun and these things, which they produce light, but they're dim compared to these other things. And so uh, you can get pretty dim galaxies that have like the same number of stars that ours do because they just don't have the big ones. Yeah. I just find anything about sort of the aging of the universe somewhat depressing. (laughs) Mm. You know, with... uh, I just want, you want everything to, to stay the time. same. Right, right. That, well, that's the same reason why Einstein and everybody before him, you know, they, want, they loved this idea of the static universe where right. everything does stay the same, roughly. Right. Not in right. detail, but in, yeah. yeah. And it is kind of sad that maybe we don't live in that kind of universe. Right? Why is that I, sad? You want something that stays the same well, all the time? Well, I don't want it to die. I don't want to die. It's not, you know, like, <laughs> in your lifetime. Well, what are you saying? I'm going to die? No. Man. No. Nope. It's just getting worse and worse. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, if we were immortal. Yes. Like I, I want to be immortal, kind of like if you're a vampire and I you're never going to die. Be a uh, it's actually going to really suck. I mean, it would be fine it's if we lived in a static universe because there'd always be stuff going on and you'd always be okay. It'd be great for vampires. It's going to be dark. And you'd finally have enough time to catch up on all those Netflix and right. Disney Plus shows. But in our <laughs> universe, things are changing. Like, and as, as things this time goes on, things are going to get more and more boring. And you're if you were really immortal, it would really suck, suck. because be because in in you know, a ten hundred trillion years from now. I mean, suck. I don't know if immortal people live that long. That's what immortal <laughs> means. <laughs> but but, but are, is it, are they like that immortal? Like really immortal? <laughs> like, I mean, that's over maybe like a... Maybe they're immortal light. Well, 
Also, the planet might not still be around by then, so. Of course not. And then you're just going to be sitting there floating in empty space and nothing is. Well, else. you're probably no, destroyed. Don't be a normal. No more Don't Netflix be immortal. even. Yeah. While it may have felt like the time since Galaxy <laughs> SX DS5 27434 last formed a star. <laughs> It was just another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. If you like this episode of Walk About the Galaxy, write us a review in the Calculus of Variations and submit it as errata to your math textbook publisher. <laughs> Be sure to like us on Facebook to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com where you can also order a walkabout tea. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Walk About the Galaxy, where you can see secret messages encoded on the walls of the office where we record the show. Catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to our listeners in British Columbia, Canada, and around the world. Follow us on Twitter. At walk underscore the underscore galaxy. And ask us questions anywhere using hashtag Walk About the Galaxy. Our theme music was composed by Richard Jerusic, our production assistant and video guru is Diego Rodriguez. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. I'm Jim Cooney. We're the Astro Quirks, signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Supernova! <laughs>